Right, hello again, and uh, now uh, I think this is day 360 <laughs> or whatever. No, it's not really. It's about day six, I think, doing these videos. Um, so uh, what we're going to look at uh, now is propor proportional control. So in order to help you understand this, I'm, I've just pulled up a number of screens. We're going to go through these. Um, so first of all, I just want to look at the, uh, the actual control algorithm that's uh, used for proportional control. So you get a better idea of exactly what's going on before we look at the software. So this is a control system diagram. Um, you can uh, probably relate this to the theory that you were given uh, during your lectures. So I'm, I'm not, this is not about you, uh, me trying to explain that to you. This is about just going through this in relation to the software. Uh, so I'm hoping that you uh, this makes a little bit more sense um, due to the lectures that you've had on the control system subject. Uh, so let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So for proportional control, um, closed loop control systems, then this is uh, what's happening. And this is directly related to the hardware and the software that we we're actually using. So here is our um, set point. So remember I talked about the uh, the oven, setting your temperature in the oven. Uh, well, this is our set point here, which is north, which has a value of zero. And this is a, um, uh, this, this um, summation here produces an error relative to whatever the position of the magnetometer is. So there's our compass position. This is the magnetometer that is actually producing uh, the uh, the value of the actual present compass position and that number comes back as uh, a number between minus 179.9 through to 0 through to 180.0. So depending on what the error is and where the compass is we'll get an error here. So we have some gain value this is a standard part of, um, of proportional um, control systems and so we have this variable k, which we're going to uh, adjust in our software and then run experiments to see exactly how well the system responds, depending on the value of k. So the output of this is k times the error, which is actually uh, something we'll be able to see. Now we're going to be able to see on the oscilloscope in real time, the error signal and also the k times the error signal. So we can actually see what's going on. Now, the servo here um, has a value uh, of, uh, you know, your nominal value of um, 1.5 milliseconds or 1500 microseconds. And, but it's limited uh, the input into the servo between the limits of 1000 and 2000 microseconds. And so this is what this symbol is representing is even though you've got a K times the error value, we still implement a limiter to actually not overdrive the servo from a um, electrical characteristics perspective. So the servo is driving the pointer and there's our compass position, but we need the compass position back in order to feed into our summation here in order to get our error. So the idea is that uh, we're trying to get to north. We take the error signal, we multiply it by some K value, which actually drives the servo to by whatever speed is required to actually uh, create to move the compass pointer in order to then get a new position which is then fed back and so what we're trying to do is get these two points here the north here north here to be zero so we get zero error so we don't drive the servo so everything's fine but from yesterday's experiments or uh, well, yesterday's for the last video's experiments um, you know you would realize the servo is actually a non-linear device and it's got a maximum speed and um, and so it's got some really unusual characteristics. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is that we increase the error value because if, say for example, let's assume that K is one. So if K is one, then whatever the error is, is K times the error. So that becomes the error here. And we know this value is limited. Now, we know that the magnetometer input information, it goes from minus 100, or just for the time being, minus 180 to plus 180. So that's the value that goes into the limiter. Well, that doesn't saturate the limiter because the midpoint of the servo drive is 1500. And therefore we are actually going plus 1500 plus 180 or 1500 minus 180. 
And we know actually at that, even with this is set to one, we know the servo at those extreme limits is actually um, at its slight physical limit because we know it's a nonlinear device. Um, and this is something you need to discuss in your report. Um, so this servo, initially, if this was at the south position, let's assume that this was actually at uh, 180 degrees, then this would try and drive the servo as fast as it can to get it back to zero. But as this gets closer and closer, as the compass position gets closer and closer to north, this number drops. And it now actually means that, say, for example, remember when we did the test yesterday, when we were down at, um, at uh, 30 microsecond offset, which would equate to, um, to uh, three, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, 30, 30 degrees, yeah, then it means the servo is really slow. So as we get to 30 degrees within our north position, the drive on the servo is reduced to very little. And so it's actually the servo is getting slower and slower as it gets closer and closer to north until you get to a point where in fact the servo doesn't drive at all because there's actually not enough drive there to make it actually drive itself to this new position of north. So, uh, so once we get to 30, remember when we did the test yesterday, um, or the test in the last video, uh, the, uh, when it got to 30, the servo uh, drive was really slow. And so it's just trying to get itself to this new north position. And once it gets a little bit closer, this drops to 20. And so as it gets to 20 degrees, then it gets even slower. And it gets to a point where it can actually get to the actual north position because there's not enough drive because K is actually set to one. So the error and the K times the error is actually just the angular offset of the magnetometer from north. And so it gets to a point where it can't actually drive the servo anymore. So it thinks it's got, well, it's got as close as it can because even though there's an error here of say, for example, maybe 15, that is not enough to drive the servo to make it move anymore. So in fact, we actually don't achieve our goal. So what we then have to do is consider, well, what do we have to do to, to get this to actually drive a little bit harder? And this is where K comes in because if K is now increased, we're amplifying the error signal. And that amplification allows us to drive the servo much harder. So let's assume that we set K to two. So we're gonna double these numbers. So when we were originally at 30 degrees here and when the servo slowed down, we're actually driving this now. We're multiplying by two and we're gonna drive it harder. So it's actually now been driven as though it'd been driven with 60. And so it does push it harder to try and get it to, um, uh, to move to get to the zero point. So we're starting to get closer to our slight final solution. But what happens is you keep on increasing K. Well, if we actually raise K to something like five, so uh, if we had this going to 30 degrees, five times 30, uh, <laughs> this is my math, uh, 150. And, um, and so what this is driving this servo really hard now, but what happens is that it's going so fast, it actually totally overshoots. So, what happens, you end up with a negative error. And so it goes back and it goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, trying to hunt for this zero point. And this is the whole point of these control systems is trying to, that's an unstable state. And we're gonna try and get this to be stable. And that's the whole point of geiger nichols formula is what is the value of K to actually make this um, a moderately good um, uh, stable system. So we're gonna look at this in more detail uh, from an experimental uh, perspective when we actually run this uh, lab and we'll be seeing this in a minute. Well, um, uh, in, an, in the next video. But, uh, so I'm just hoping you understand what's physically happening here um, in terms of the control system. So let's see how that relates to the software. So um, first of all, uh, let's look at the HMI so you understand a little bit more about the HMI. Where did I put that? There we go. Right, so when we select option eight, which is the proportional uh, control uh, uh, system, it will come out with messages like this. So it tells oh, <laughs> somebody's at the door. <laughs> so uh, hello again. That was uh, Amazon at the door. It is uh, at least they're still delivering uh, during this COVID nineteen uh, uh, period. 
Um, so this is more bits for the uh, camera gear to try and improve on the lighting, which I don't know how successful that will be, but uh, we shall see. Anyhow, where were we? Uh, right, um, we were looking at uh, selecting option eight from the main menu of the HMI, which is the proportional uh, control um, uh, side of, uh, of our uh, proportional algorithm. So, uh, what the the first thing this uh, screen comes up with is a status area, which we'll see in the top area here. I don't know whether you can see my uh, cursor moving. It's not very clear uh, in this paint environment. And uh, within that, we've got the present compass position, um, the present P and the PI gain control, uh, get gain values. This is the K value. So it tells me what the K value was, because uh, we can select this. So this is actually telling me what it's presently set to, which is zero. And we've also got a, a channel one and channel two test point outputs, um, gain or attenuation uh, values. And also it tells us what the channel one and channel two or the, the TP1 and TP2 outputs on the um, on the compass control unit are actually showing as values in real time. So on channel one, we've got the error signal coming back. And on channel two, we've got the proportional result, i.e. k times the error. So why do we have these uh, gain uh, attenuation uh, values here? Well, because we want to see the maths in real time, then if you uh, have, for example, let's assume we've got an error signal of uh, in an instant in time, uh, 180 uh, degrees, so we've got the maximum error, then what you'll see on the oscilloscope is um, that 180 goes straight into the DAC value. So remember the DAC value from previous um, videos is uh, set to its midpoint zero volts of 512. Well, what it's doing is it's actually going to add to that. So we've got a range of plus um, uh, 512 and minus 512. So the absolute maths value goes gets loaded into the DAC. So if we have a number that is below 512, then it will actually display that as an analog value. So you can actually correlate that, um, the actual analog value on the scope uh, through the relationship between, um, remember that, uh, 2.5 volts is the complete range of the DAC, and therefore 2.5 uh, uh, volts and divided by 1024 give you that uh, incremental value. And therefore you can actually look at the analog value and determine what the actual math is saying. So that means that uh, if we've got a value of uh, 180, which we were saying the south position as an error value, then that 180 gets put into the uh, DAC. And remember, it's offset by uh, 512, so that's our zero volts. So we'll either see, depending on uh, the way this is going, uh, either uh, um, uh, uh, 512 plus 180 or 512 minus 180, and that's converted into an analog value which we'll then see on the oscilloscope, so you can actually see the maths. So the thing is that if you actually end up with numbers that are bigger than this, say for example, if you, um, uh, we could actually have a gain of, for example, two on this. So if our error was 180, we could actually then have um, the amplification, for example, the error on channel one, we could have that as two. So on our scope, we could actually amplify that signal and so we could actually then see rather than the 180, that would be 360. And that still hasn't used the maximum range of the HD, which is basically plus or minus 512. But as soon as we actually saturate the, um, the analog signal coming out, then we end up with flat lines are that peaked at plus 1.25 volts and minus 1.25 volts. And so that allows us then uh, to control what we see on the scope. So if we're trying to maximize the information on the scope and see what's really going on, then we can use the gain and attenuation factors to actually uh, display all of this. Now, this is really important when it comes to integration 
because in integration, the numbers are actually so large that in fact you need to attenuate significantly in order to see, this, see the information on the scope without it saturating, i.e. flatlining at the plus 1.25 volts or minus 1.25 volts. So when you see flat lines on the actual oscilloscope trace, you know that you've saturated the, um, it, you've saturated the maths effectively. And what you need to do is add attenuation in order to bring it down so you can actually see um, a smooth curved uh, information to give you an idea of what's really going on inside the system. You could do this by simulation um, and uh, run it through some algorithms and display all the numbers and all the rest of it. But the fact you can see this in real time is absolutely brilliant. So this is why we've gone down this route. So these um, attenuation, uh, the attenuation for and gain for channel one, and attenuation and gain for channel two. Uh, and we'll look in, uh, we'll observe that when we look at the scope uh, later on. So uh, what options do we have then in terms of the HMI here? So if we look down the left hand side, bottom left hand side here, we can actually run the proportional algorithm, which is great. Um, two, we can edit the gain. So this is the K value, which we saw up here, which is at, at the moment set to zero. And we can also uh, edit the gain attenuation for both the channel one and channel two. And we can also move the compass to approximate north and move the compass to approximate south. And this is really important. If we're trying to observe how good this actual algorithm actually is in terms of uh, when we actually put the K values in, how well is it performing? Then if we put the compass to a south position, we'll be able to see the worst case scenario. And therefore we can see how the system actually responds to uh, this worst case uh, value given a particular value of K that we're feeding in. So let's just go back to uh, that here. So here, there's our K value. And uh, what we're doing is um, that's the speed at which it's driving the servo. So this, this is about the response time to get this to get back to a north position. Uh, let's just go back uh, to that image. Uh, there we go. So. Um, so that's the uh, HMI uh, controls, and we, you won't be able to see this when we're running the experiment because that's to the right of the uh, camera, um, but I will tell you what I'm doing just like we did in the previous videos. So how does this all relate to the software? Well, let's have a look at the software. Now then, here's the HMI. Uh, this is running proportional control. Uh, once again, we press X uh, to exit the um, uh, the actual any of the particular tests. Uh, let me just uh, let me just go prior to that. Uh, sorry, there we are. Uh, from option eight, when you enter option eight, this is the software that you actually enter into first. This is proportional control, and here we've got our selection option numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven allows us to exit from this to so mean return back to the HMI. But otherwise, if one is the run proportional control two is to get the K value, uh, three is the gain attenuation values for channel one, four is the similar for channel two, move the compass north is on five and move the compass south is on six. So that's the, um, that's the selection when we enter a key on the uh, HMI, this is what's picked up and therefore actions these functions that are shown here. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail in the gain attenuation. These are just simple maths functions and you've already seen the compass moving north and the compass moving south. So I'm not going into that, but let's have to look, actually look at the proportional control algorithm. So let's assume we've actually selected um, uh, number one. And also prior to that, we've actually set the K value to one just to begin with. So uh, also just a note, when we exit from this software, it automatically defaults all the gain attenuations back to one uh, so that it doesn't cause any problems. Um, so here we have the run proportional control and uh, now this is really important here, you'll see the trigger. Now in order for you to, when you, as soon as you run the algorithm and you positioned your compass in a south position, it means that we can trigger the scope um, externally on this event and what will happen will be you can actually see everything in real time as soon as you run the algorithm. So you can see everything that's happening um, over the period until it either becomes unstable or stable, depending on what happens, or you can actually see the response time, which is really interesting. So that's why we have a trigger, uh, which actually synchronizes everything. And this is just a delay here um, for the, oscillo uh, for the uh, oscilloscope to uh, recognize this as a trigger pulse, because it needs to have a certain amount of time uh, associated with it for it to be picked up by the scope. 
Um, this is uh, uh, X's uh, allow us to exit from the actual proportional uh, control uh, algorithm so we can get back to our um, uh, this menu here where we can actually change uh, parameters and uh, here is actually going off to get uh, the uh, compass data so it's going to go off and get the present compass position let's just refer back to our um, AutoCAD here. So this is actually going off to get the magnetometer information here. That's the first thing it does because it needs that in order to work out whether it needs to, it needs to find the error. In order to do that, it needs to know where the pointer is at this particular point in time. So uh, let's see, one of the too many windows here. Uh, right, let's go back here. So this is going off to get the compass data and the compass data, uh, let me just go into where it gets the compass data. This is the get compass data. And this is where it uh, communicates via I squared C to the CMPS uh, 12 device with the MEMS device. And you'll notice here that um, it is actually offsetting all the values. Remember the number that comes back from the compass is a number between zero and 3,599. And so we have to convert that into our angular displacement uh, in because uh, it's in tenths of degrees, we want to turn it into degrees. And you'll notice if everything works correctly, this instruction here is where it actually takes the global compass value and takes the value after it's been signed and then divides it by 10. And we actually end up with the correct compass position uh, in the correct range. Let's just go back to AutoCAD. There we go. And it produces these numbers as a mean. So it goes from minus 179.9 through to zero through to 180. Uh, depending on what the present um, value has come back from the uh, compass. So this is the I squared C, this is the extraction of the data. And as soon as it's got that information, it actually, uh, if it's asked to display this, it actually puts it straight into channel four, which allows us to actually see this compass information. So let's go back to our main. So it goes off to get the compass and it double checks to make sure the information, um, there's not been an error in the I squared C because if it has, it doesn't use the data. Um, and now this is the limiter. This is where it says, well, oh yeah, before we do that, uh, result is equal to proportional calculation. So let's go off and see the proportional calculation, which I think is just down here. There we go. Uh, proportional calculation, and all it's doing is saying the error is equal to the minus global compass value. Well, we just extracted that value. And the reason it's minus is we've got to make sure the compass moves in the right direction. Otherwise it's actually uh, going to uh, go totally in the wrong direction and not do what it's meant to do, i.e. won't aim for the north or zero uh, position. And so it takes the error and it displays this on the oscilloscope by loading the DAC with the actual error value. And now here we're going to get the proportional result, which is the error times the global K value, which is the K value you entered. So at the moment that might be one for our, our starting point, which makes sense. And then what we're going to do is do different tests as we vary the value of K. And we load that value into the channel two um, output. So this is test point one that we're seeing, and this is test point two. And it then loads those, both those values as close as it can uh, to try and synchronize them all. And um, what this is doing here is just checking the maths associated with this because this does a, um, a float to integer conversion and you've got to be really, really careful when you perform such tasks because the integer system uh, can't represent the floating point system and therefore you've got to take a lot of care when you do that conversion. So this is only a test for the software, nothing you need to worry about. And so we return um, back to our normal routine. Here we go, so we've got our new value, but we also noticed that um, uh, we've got to a PWM width now, which is going to be this uh, server null point minus the result. This is the result here. But that result needs to be limited because of the way servos work, because the maximum uh, signal is, let's just go back to AutoCAD, so this maximum signal here is limited to between 1000 and 2000 microseconds. So what we're doing in the software is actually making sure that limit's true. And then what we do is globally load this new PWM value into the uh, PWM drive. And so the servo's um, being correctly driven. And should we exit all of this, we revert, uh, because this is going around cyclically all the time until we press uh, the X to exit. 
And as soon as we exit, we reset the DACs to the midpoint position, which is 512, which is zero volts on the output, and we load all the DACs with that value. So that's what's going on in the software. I hope that is clear. There's a lot of information, um, but if you go through this several times, or if it's not very good, then email me <laughs> and uh, I can try and explain it again. But um, uh, all the information is there, and I've tried to make it as clear as possible uh, by uh, showing you uh, the relationship between the software, this closed loop control system, uh, and the HMI. And so now we're going to run the experiment for real, and that's going to be the next video. Okay, thank you very much indeed.